paper. They gave it a headline calling it Civil Disobedience Not Christian. Civil Disobedience Not Christian. Now, in light of what I've heard and been presented here the last number of weeks, I wanted to read at least portions of this to you and then make some remarks about some scriptures. It begins by saying, Dear Editor, much has been done in the name of God throughout time, but it's quite interesting to note that much of that supposedly done in accordance with God's will has not been His will. Many have seen fit to declare civil disobedience a righteous act in response to social injustices committed against them. But uh, one should hasten to examine whether social injustices are of the type that would hinder one from serving God. If a Christian should operate a business in Israel, he might have to close his business on the Jewish Sabbath in order to obey Jewish law. But would this hinder his service to God as a Christian? Even though it might be a social injustice to him as one who does not observe the Jewish Sabbath, it would not interfere with his spiritual obligation to God as a Christian. In other words, one should realize the difference between a law that stops one from exercising what he believes to be one of his rights and a law that would force one to renounce his religious and moral beliefs and participate in acts that are against his beliefs and morals. In the middle of the corrupt society of the Roman Empire, Christianity came into existence. If at any time in history civil disobedience could have been carried out in the name of Christ to meet social injustices, it would have been at this time. But was this the case? Did the Holy Spirit through inspired men teach civil disobedience as the way to meet Roman social injustices? And we could put there any injustice in any society. First century Christians were taught to pray for their rulers. First Timothy 2 verses 1 through 3. Honor the king. First Peter 2 verse 17. Pay taxes. Matthew 22 verse 21. And obey the laws that govern them. Romans 13, 1 through 7. Doesn't this contradict the teaching of many toward what a Christian's attitude and response should be toward social injustices? Jesus never led a protest march down the main street of Rome or held a sit-in inside the temple in Jerusalem. Followers of Jesus Christ lived, preached, and practiced the enriching principles of the gospel of peace. Now, that was written by a young man in 1969 by the day, name of David Brown, Arkansas Democrat. Did it sound like it could be written today? What I'm saying about that is is something that we miss sometimes. Few of us have lived through treacherous times already. And in view of happenings even today in our nation's capital, and in view of the lessons that have been brought here lately, and we all know that however we think and act, we must have authority from our Savior, Jesus Christ, to think and act in a certain way. Paul had to address that to that mixed up, messed up congregation known as the church at Corinth. Twice in 1 Corinthians, he said, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and the whole context is through verse 20. But he said, um, let me turn to 6. I was at 10. That's the second place. <clears throat> all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, one thing that needs to be understood about what he means is to be remind ourselves that an expedient carries out a God-ordained action. The definition of the word law is that it is uh, an action. 
It is a rule of action. When we baptize somebody, we're complying with the rule of action. When we observe the Lord's Supper from the perfect law of liberty, we're complying with the rule of action. So when you consider the state of affairs in the church of Corinth, and Paul says all things are lawful, but all things are expedient, what he's getting at, and Matthew Henry has this to say about it, some among the Corinthians seem to have been ready to say all things are lawful for me. This dangerous conceit Paul opposes. There is a liberty wherewith Christ has made us free in which we must stand fast. But surely a Christian would never put himself into the power of any bodily appetite. And if you read the whole thing here, you'll see really what he's saying is that your bodies are to be used as instruments of service to God and not to practice immorality. That's really what he's saying. So an expedient is that which carries out the law or the action in the quickest, best way possible. An expedient always has an advantage to it. You may have several options by which you could discharge something. But one of them may be better than all the rest because it has greater advantage in getting it done quicker and better than any of the others. But there's a point made here. You can have things that are lawful, but that does not mean they're the best things to do. Because all things authorized are not obligatory. And that's an important point in rightly dividing the word of truth and the Bible authority sometimes we overlook. And that ties in a whole lot with the rights that we hear so much talked about today. Paul had a right to have the church at Corinth to support him. And he makes that very clear. I had a right receive financial support from you because those who give their full time to the preaching of the gospel God has said can live all the gospel but he said I didn't do it now why didn't he? he had the authority from Christ to do it because he didn't deem it advantageous he wanted it to be something that would say to you I'm not going to have you think at all that I'm doing this just to get in your pocketbook and those things change from situations to circumstances and from people to people. Now, when you go over to 1 Corinthians 10, you'll have him say the same thing again. It gets even clearer here, I think. Verse 23, in the context of the whole thing, is all the way through verse 33. And uh, verse 23, chapter 10, and verse 23, all things are lawful, for me but all things are not expedient all things are lawful for me now listen to the next part of it but all things edify that means spiritually build up but all things edify not so you may have rights but if those rights become a stumbling block or a hindrance to others you forego those rights you have Bible authority to do it now here's what um Matthew Henry said, by the way, he wrote about 1710. <laughs> there were cases wherein Christians might eat what had been offered to idols without sin. Now, sin is a transgression of the law, so they could eat that thing offered to idol, and it wouldn't be transgression of the law. Then he says, such as when the flesh was sold in the market as common food for the priest to whom it had been given. But a Christian must not merely consider what is lawful, but what is expedient in order to edify others. Now he makes an interesting comment down here. He says, this is the great end of all religion and directs us where express rules are wanting. In other words, you may not have something specifically addressed in black and white in the scriptures. But when it comes to edifying others and wanting them to think the best about God's people and the church and the gospel and Christianity, you forego some things that you have authority from Christ to do. I think this is timely and the reason I chose to do it, first of all, by reading that letter is because 
Some of us faced this kind of thing a long time ago. And folks before I ever discovered America were facing that kind of thing. And it's obvious that the New Testament of Jesus Christ addressed the matter of all things are lawful, but all things not expedient. And so in this great hewing cry for rights, though they be lawful, we have to ask the question, does the ignorant person really understand what we're doing? We say, well, I've got a right to do that. But is it the best thing to do? Does it really edify? Does it build up spiritually? You see, that was the whole problem with eating meat soft idols. Because he says, now if they offer you that to eat, and they don't tell you that it was offered an idol, eat it. But if they tell you when they offer it to you that it was offered to an idol, then don't eat it for conscience sake. And he says, not your conscience. You know there's nothing to it. You're converted. You're enlightened. But for the conscious sake of him that told you. Because he doesn't know. And that takes some uh, thinking in view of various situations and circumstances. And I'll just put it this way. I would not want to be a Christian exercising my rights and be found among the crowd in Washington, D.C. today in view of the way it turned out. Though I would have every scriptural and civil right to be there. And he said, that's just your opinion. Well, then you apply these things and tell me why they're here and what you understand them to be and how they affect all our lives. Paul is talking about then, yeah, there are a lot of things you can do and they're authorized by God. But if people don't understand them, they haven't been taught just like the meat off the idols. You have to consider that. No man liveth to himself, Paul said, and no man dieth unto himself. We are influencing others either for good or bad by the way we act. Without ever saying a word. And none of us are perfect in those things, but with the way things are getting in these United States today, we better be giving close attention to these things as to how the rule of action that is the New Testament and perfect law of liberty instructs us in matters of this nation and in matters that could be very up, well, cause a great deal of upheaval before it's over with. I'll close with this. Back in the Civil War, David Lipscomb, we won't go into all of his view of things, but uh, he wouldn't uh, have anything to do with civil government, period. If you know anything about the state of Tennessee, especially the city of Nashville, it changed hands several times during the war, Confederate, Union, etc. When the Union had it, they would send officers out to the preachers in their congregations to listen to what they were preaching. Now, why would they do that? Because the denominational churches throughout the South, the preachers in those congregations had been instrumental in sowing the seed of secession. So they were seeing what was being said by those preachers. And one was sent out to hear David Lipscomb preach in Nashville. When he came back, he made this report. Well, I couldn't tell by what he said whether he was for secession or against it or for the union or not. But I can tell you one thing, he was for Jesus Christ and his gospel. And we must think about that. We must understand about that. And we must recognize that we, above all things, are in a kingdom that will not be shaken. Everything else is going to be shaken. But as a faithful citizen of the kingdom of heaven, nobody can touch you. Jesus said, fear not him who is able to kill the body. But I tell you, you shall fear. Fear him who uh, will destroy both body and soul after, he's been, after the person is dead in hell. Our focus is on spiritual things. And whatever we do in this life is a passing thing. Or else you take the name pilgrim off your name. No pilgrim puts down roots. Nobody does. No pilgrim puts down roots. As the song says, we're just passing through. And God says, here's how you live as you just pass through. And you must be mindful then of your brethren and their thinking, of your relationship to civil government, 
of even civil government when it breaks down, and you can't let those things dominate us. If we were as dedicated to the cause of Christ and the kingdom of heaven as soldiers of the Lord as we are to some of the things of this life, what a difference it would make in the Lord's church in any generation. If you're not a child of God, then now's the time to become one. You don't have any assurance you'll ever leave this building tonight. But you can become one by believing that Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ, being buried with your Lord in baptism, and living faithful to Him in His church. As a child of God, if you've committed sin, then to repent of them, confess those sins, and pray for forgiveness is what God has taught you to do. That's His rule of action for the unfaithful child of God. So if you need to obey the gospel or respond to the gospel invitation for the reasons that it's offered, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.